So hi, here we are for another of our Monday Facebook Lives. Um, I'm sorry to say that my hair is going absolutely bonkers during this lockdown with not being able to see my hairdresser. Um, so I'm starting to look <laughs> more and more Yeti-like as the days go on. Um, so we asked about we asked for some suggestions for our Facebook Live. We've got a long list of things that we'd like to share with you. Um, but Darren was right in there asking about scapular dyskinesis earlier this afternoon. Um, so thank you, Darren, for that. And that's what we're going to talk about this evening, um, the relevance or otherwise of scapular dyskinesis. Um, and that actually worked very well because I had a gentleman that I saw on a telehealth com consultation the other day um, who had had physiotherapy before lockdown, had actually done fantastically well, got back to all the things that he wanted to do. Um, but was still concerned that he had this asymmetry in his scapula. He didn't have any pain, um, but his physiotherapist had said they couldn't help anymore. Um, and so essentially he was very concerned with this ongoing um, asymmetry. Now, I think the first thing to say, um, I'm sorry, before I say any more, uh, Lee asked about radicular, uh, cervical radicular pain and shoulder pain. So we're going to make that a subject in the next few weeks. Um, and also somebody else said, could I talk about um, how I've adopted my assessment uh, with telehealth? Um, because obviously that's a reality that lots of us are facing. So Anita and Rachel, thank you for that as well. Um, and I will look forward to putting those together for you over the next two weeks. So scapular dyskinesis. So this guy was obsessed with the fact that he had what he perceived as this winging scapula. And despite the fact his pain was gone and he was back to doing everything that he wanted to do, he was still very worried about sorting this out. Now, it's important to say before we go any further that we're just talking about somebody with insidual, insidious onset shoulder pain. Um, doesn't report anything that might be consistent with a true nerve injury that would give us true scapular winging. We're just talking about the scapular dyskinesis that we see in association with non-traumatic shoulder pain. Now, it, just to quickly mention, because again, I had a very interesting case, a climber um, who'd had an injury where he'd fallen off um, whilst doing a climb, he'd done an overreach and slipped and so um, had gone to see a local physiotherapist. His injury was actually in his hand, it wasn't anything to do with his shoulder. Um, and the physiotherapist had done a very, um, what sounded like quite a, um, a deep massage, shall we say, around the shoulder. And this guy came to me because he was very worried that he'd developed this mark winging and was struggling to lift his arm up. Now, when he came to see me, he actually had um, a spinal accessory nerve injury. So the, the force of the massage had been sufficient to give him a transient neuropraxia. Now, spinal accessory nerve injuries are interesting. Um, they're actually usually the most common, highly, the most common reason is actually usually etrogenic, so associated with surgery, and commonly anything to do with head and neck surgery or any lymph node biopsies. Um, it also can result from any from stabbing, any heavy blows, carrying very heavy. I've had police ladies who had very heavy body armour and that gave them a spinal accessory nerve injury after a particularly heavy shift. It's also reported that we can get it after amorous love biting, but I'm not quite sure who did that research. Um, the key thing with spinal accessory nerve is it's often painful because of the load on the plexus they often have a very droopy shoulder and you can most expose that winging by doing resisted external rotation um, and they they can't achieve full elevation range they're really limited that's quite different from long thoracic nerve now those of you that joined us last week we talked about parsonage turner syndrome and certainly the long thoracic nerve is one of those nerves that can be affected by that pathology it's different in that patients can generally get full range of movement it doesn't have the same pain features that a spinal accessory nerve does. Um, and generally, if patients get pain, it's usually secondary to the fact that their scapula is just not moving normally in the long term. But that's a true nerve injury. Again, long th thoracic nerve injuries are often etrogenic in terms of related to surgery. Um, they can relate to trauma and there's definitely an association with viral viruses or post-vaccination. Um, but the other thing you'll see is slim ladies or anybody having auxiliary um, clearances or biopsies, if they're slim, have a real risk of a long thoracic nerve. And similarly, um, sorry, I'm trying not to say hello to all these people that I know that are joining in. It's fabulous to have you here and thanks for giving up your time. 
Um, so sorry, back to the long thoracic nerve. So the other thing we see quite often is people who have um, obstetric or gynecological surgery and positioning if they're slimmy and they're actually um, on stretch. So again, just that's when we're talking about that true winging, with serratus winging, often you'll see it at rest and obviously it's most exposed by doing wall press or those serratus type tests. So we're not talking about that tonight. We're just going to talk about scapular dyskinesis. Now, why do I think it's important? Well, one, really this patient raised it because they obviously think it's important despite the fact they've now not got any symptoms. So what are we gonna talk about? Well, I think there's some common beliefs when it comes to the scapula. Firstly, um, that there's a link between abnormal scapular kinematics and pain. Secondly, poor old upper traps gets maligned as the bad guy and we get obsessed with differences in muscle recruitment. Thirdly, that scapular dyskinesis can help predict patients that are likely to develop shoulder pain. Fourthly, that scapular-based interventions may have some superiority over our rotator cuff ones. And finally, there's all sorts of fancy things we can do assessment-wise. Well, let's have a little look at those. In terms of the link of scapular kinematics and shoulder pain, it's really not well supported. Essentially, if I took 100 people who'd never had shoulder pain, 100 people with shoulder pain and put them all in a line, um, and film their scapula, there would be an equal distribution of asymmetrical scapulas. Asymmetri asymmetry is very normal. And actually, if you look at overhead athletes, about 61% of overhead athletes will have scapular dyskinesis or asymmetry in how their scapula moves. And actually, if you follow athletes over time, they'll often develop scapular dyskinesis as part of their adaptation. And it's well described that we get changes in range of movement in the shoulder. Well, again, we see changes in terms of the scapula. So we have to be a little bit careful because if it's a normal finding using a kind of yes, no classification scale, we need to be very careful about making patients too vigilant about it. Now, before you panic and think the scapula has got nothing to do with it, us observing it, there are asymmetries in non-symptomatic populations. Now, if we take the patients with shoulder pain into a lab and then we compare them to the people without pain, there are some key differences, both in terms of the ratios of muscles working and when those muscles work in range. But also if we use things like fancy 3D fluoroscopy, there are also um, some common themes in terms of a loss of upward rotation, protraction and posterior tilt. The challenge is, whilst those lab-based studies using very fancy kit or needle EMG can show those changes, we don't seem to be able to pick them up reliably in the clinic. Now, again, if we look at scapular kinematics and what they're impacted by, there's no doubt if people have a very stiff shoulder, then they use their scapula differently and they get some of these typical compensation patterns, particularly with um, upper trapezius working because they can't access anything else. Um, if you fatigue somebody, so there's some nice studies by Ebo et al, looking at somebody's scapular dyskinesis, fatiguing their rotator cuff and showing that that worsens their scapular dyskinesis. Similarly, people with massive rotator cuff tears, we see some common themes in how their scapula compensates. So it would seem that if we have pathology, we have so if we have significant pathology like a massive tear, if we have a nerve injury, um, if we have significant stiffness, or if we fatigue the rotator cuff, we can actually affect scapular dyskinesis. But the other thing that will cause it is a patient who's scared to move. So we know in shoulder pain now that some of the biggest predictors of outcome are in that psychosocial domain. And we've got studies showing us that if people are anxious or have a lot of fear avoidance or pain related worrying, especially with regard to a certain movement or lifting their arm up, that has an influence on muscle recruitment. They just preferentially use the big muscles around their shoulder as a kind of protect response and almost lose their normal weight transfer because they're trying to protect the shoulder. And of course, that could potentially relate in scapular dyskinesis. But the key is, in terms of us clinically, we might observe that, but what's fundamental is addressing those fears rather than getting hung up on that scapular dyskinesis. Now, I mentioned about this belief that upper traps is the bad guy. And if you've joined us before, we did a whole session just looking at this. The bottom line is there's a massive variation in people with pain compared to an asymptomatic population. People in pain move differently. Your central nervous system is very clever and finds a strategy to allow you to keep moving. 
Now the bottom line with upper fibres of trapezius, if you think back to those examples I gave you before that seem to result in scapula for dyskinesis, i.e. stiffness, significant cuff tear, um, nerve involvement and actually cervical spine involvement as well. Actually, if we look back to the studies, if I'm stiff, I use it because I can't use anything else. If I've got a massive cuff tear, I use it because I can't use anything else to get that movement initi initiated. Um, and in somebody with neck driven shoulder pain, um, oh, right, thank you, Lee, that's a very important question. Let me get back to that, my three types of scapular dyskinesis. I'll finish what I'm going to say and I'll come back to that fabulous question at the end. Um, back to upper traps. So yeah, so um, if you've got somebody with a neck driven shoulder pain, then upper traps may be truly a little bit dominant at the beginning because it's segmentally facilitated and again, it's a protective strategy. But actually, if we look at patients with shoulder pain and we look at the studies that describe this overactivity in upper fibers of trapezius that actually form the basis of lots of people trying to switch it off, Actually, it was only overactive in the later degrees of elevation. So if you like, it was more common for it to be weak. And so people would move and then it was trying to play catch up at a mechanical disadvantage. So whilst we have needle EMG studies showing us there are changes in the ratio of activation, there's a massive heterogeneity across our populations. And so really it's about just making sure we address some of their fears about movement and use some simple strategies to improve their shoulder function. Now, we also said that the general belief that scapular dyskinesis is predictive of pathology, and there was certainly a study that's um, by Hickey et al. that suggested that if you had scapular dyskinesis, you were 43% more likely to develop shoulder pain in the subsequent season. Now, I think if we're honest and we go back to the statistics in that study, actually, it wasn't quite that dramatic. The relative risk was actually much, small, much, much, much smaller than that. What's interesting, there are a few studies that show if you just use a yes-no score at the beginning of a season, then if you have a, a massive change in load, that may give you a slight increased risk of developing shoulder pain. However, it's negligible in some studies. What seems to be more significant is change. So if you did a yes-no score at the beginning of the season and then you film them again, let's say, three months down the line and there was a significant worsening, that change may have more relevance than just using it as a standalone measure at the beginning of the season. And I think in that situation, we have to be honest, the jury is out. So, uh, winning post-surgery... I'm going to have to come back to all these fantastic questions. Just let me get through this. Um, the, the last two things were about scapular-based interventions and also about assessment. So scapular-based interventions, is there any superiority? Um, what is clear in the shoulder, the good news is, as somebody who supposedly works as a shoulder specialist, the evidence supports that doing shoulder-specific exercise is preferential to general exercise. There is a systematic review of scapular-based interventions that suggested about six weeks. They may have some preference to general shoulder exercise, but actually that after that period, it's not borne out. As long as you're doing something to the shoulder, then both approaches work. What I would say to you is when is a cuff exercise, sorry, when is a scapular exercise, not a cuff exercise. If you look at the attachment of the rotator cuff onto the scapula, we can't differentiate these two things. And unless we had a nerve injury where we have to target a particular muscle to get it stronger, why would we want to? Because that system functions together. So when we look at our scapular-based interventions, what's interesting is there is evidence that we change ratios of muscle, but that doesn't have to correlate with changing what we observe in terms of that scapular dyskinesis. And interestingly, patients get better in terms of their pain and their function, and yet that doesn't correlate with an observable change in that dyskinesis. I think if you talk to a lot of the people who work in sport, I was lucky enough to lecture with Martin Asker on a virtual conference the other day and he was saying that having once upon a time being an absolute scapular obsessive he now just accepts that it's part of the wondrous spectrum of how people move so the good news is you don't seem to have to change scapular kinematics from our simple yes no looking at that asymmetry to be able to change pain and function in people with shoulder pain so where does that leave us is there any point assessing the scapula well, there's been some great questions about the different classification systems. Currently, there are 41 different assessment procedures described 
before assessing the scapula. Only 12% of them have any intertestinal reliability and that 12% are the static measures. So if you like somebody with their arms by their side, somebody with their arms here, maybe up in range, and measuring from the spine to the scapula or using our iPhones, some of these digital um, goniometers or balance measures. But the bottom line is the static measures have now been shown to have no correlation whatsoever with what happens when we move. So you can look pretty pants at the start, but actually you could move really well or recruit your system very effectively. That's why symptom modification in terms of the scapular assistance test has become very, very popular because essentially it's, it's based on those original studies that suggested there was a theme of a loss of upward rotation, a loss of posterior tilt. So if we passively did that and changed somebody's pain, it was very much believed that that then meant they should do scapular exercises. Now, a couple of things we need to be careful about. In terms of the scapular assistance test, there was a study looking at 3D MRI um, that actually showed it did increase the size of the subacromial space. But with some recent research, it's less clear how relevant that is. And actually, it's probably more to do with the size of what's in that space. However, there's no doubt it did improve upward rotation and protraction. However, the other thing, when we put our hands on somebody's scapula and, help, and then reassess the effect it has on their movement, we're also unloading that upper quadrant. So we're making it easier for the shoulder to do its job. So I think we have to be a little bit careful in terms of the interpretation. What's interesting is if we look at prognostic studies that clearly show that most of our prognostic factors in shoulder pain are in that psychosocial domain or associated with lifestyle factors, apart from the amount of pain and disability somebody has when they first present, the only physical predictor of outcome in Rachel Chester's work was the scapular assistance test. So essentially, if you were able to change somebody's symptoms the first time you met them, you could be more confident they were going to respond to rehabilitation. Now, of course, there's lots of other things like self-efficacy, the length of time they've had their pain, all those other things that we've mentioned. But interestingly, the scapular assistance test did seem to have some predictive value. There's a surgeon called John Kuhn, who's based in the States, who did a similar thing that he presented at the Scapular Summit a few years ago. And he also showed in over 550 patients with non-traumatic rotator cuff tears that if he could change their symptoms with the scapular assistance test the first time he met them, then he they had an 80 to 85 chance of getting better with rehab. Now, it doesn't mean we have to be able to change it. However, what I would challenge is if I do a scapular assistance test, it means I have to do scapular-based exercises. I don't. I need to exercise the cuff and the scapulas together. Now, there's been so in terms let me just finish in terms of assessment and then i'm going to come to all these amazing questions there's all sorts of great interaction tonight guys this is fabulous for me if i can change somebody's pain that's great it probably identifies a responder and all it means to me is i'm going to probably emphasize the scapula as part of their cuff and scapular exercise so if we look at Anne cool's lovely work just doing short lever external rotation against a resistance it seems to be a great way of normalizing those ratios which has been a big basis of Anne's work and actually just get the cuff and the scapular muscles doing their job and if they can do that maybe I've just put a band around their back to reinforce that scapula and give them some feedback or I could do it with a ball behind them on the wall and do it like a wall squat all I'm looking is something that replicates what changes the patient's pain. I don't think it means that we do scapula-based exercise. Now, in terms of assessment, where does that leave us? Well, guys, I'm afraid that yes, no is about as good as it gets. There was a, let me just get on these questions because there were all sorts of great questions. Um, one of them was about, can we use these classification systems? So Ben Kibler described um, the type one, two, and three. Um, and I actually did a fellowship with Ben Kibler way back in... 1995 I think with Ben Kibler and Tim Yule um, and I spent a couple of weeks out in Kentucky and then went back to the scapular summit the sad the sad reality is that if you look at the intertester reliability of the type 1 2 and 3 classification system it's actually very very poor and remember again that it's very very subjective all we really see from all the many scapular researchers that have spent a lot of time 
<laughs> Thanks, Adam. Great to have you here. I'm very honoured. And I will come back to that question in just one minute. I've got to stop reading the questions and answer the, them one at a time. Um, so the type one, two and three, waste of your time. Yes, no is as good as it gets. And how relevant is it anyway? For me, if I've got somebody doing a loaded exercise, I'd quite like that scapula to be congruent because I think that correlates with transfer of load. Um so no, Lee, there is no reliability in scapula assessment. It's not a good investment of your time. And I would say symptom mod just the scapula assistant as a symptom modification may give you some value. Um, so Adam, I think you what you highlight there is very important in terms of it identifies responders. So yes, there's no doubt it's potentially a group that are more likely to get better. I think it's really important for me to be honest that the majority of patients I see are three, four years down the line. So natural history hasn't done its job, they've failed. And yet in those patients, I can still affect a change with scapula assistance. I'm not claiming any biomechanical effect. All I'm doing is something that's unloading that shoulder. So you could argue it's just replicating what we already know is I need to unload things, or as Greg would say, calm shit down to then build it up again, or unload to reload. So for me, it's a small part of my assessment, but if I've got somebody who's very reluctant to move, it can just be part of, if you like, the symptom modification I'd achieve with my education, uh, my validation, my reframing of their pain to get them moved. So I'm not claiming any magic effects but again as you know I like a symptom modification approach because I think it's one way of approaching some of those negative descending influences if I can change somebody's movement experience and change their pain immediately I don't say I'm going to change their pain I just go through some stuff and I go oh that feels easier to move that we know from the pain sciences has a massive modulating effect on some of those descending influences, both in terms of that expectancy violation and predictive processing. So I do think it has a role. Um, ooh, symptom modification, most important. Um, oh, let me have a look. Oh, Adam, thank you. I've, I feel like I've passed my viva with you now. Thank you, that's a relief. Um, I, I'm not very good at scrolling up this to see the questions, guys. Let me just try. Oh, here we go. There you go. Joe and technology. Um, so, Abby, we've covered your favourite thing. Sarah's trying to get her son to sleep. Um, da -da -da -da. So, I don't use three types of dyskinesia. Guys, we can't stratify them. It has no meaning in our treatment. Um, winging post-surgery. As you'll remember, I said at the outset, when we look at true scapular winging, Actually, a lot of um, long thoracic and certainly spinal accessory stuff is surgically based. However, after stabilization surgery, one of the most common um, nerves that gets damaged is the axillary nerve. And we did a thing about that a couple of weeks ago on Facebook Live. So winging post-surgery, posterior stabilization and label repair. I'd want to check that I haven't got any um, evidence of clear muscle weakness. You'd want to check out your cuff in terms of supscapular nerve. Um, not so because they've had a posterior stabilization, but also the axillary nerve and particularly the posterior branch. So look at your teres minor and your posterior cuff. If they haven't got any true weakness, remember stiffness will drive scapular winging um, as a compensation. They're just trying to find a way to move. Um, and in terms for me, I just always like to do some sort of short lever through range posterior cuff work just to get that system engaged for a foundation of load if it's appropriate. So in answer to your question about a post-op patient, I think if you look at the limited evidence we have about the influence of restriction, you kind of need around 70% of your rotational range when you're doing stuff above head. So, and often what you'll find with your posterior stabilizations is actually where they get stiff is at the back of the joint in this posterior superior complex. So that's, hello from Argentina, looking at internal rotation in neutral. So it's worth having a look at that. So again, I'd be looking, is it stiff? Because remember that can be a driver. Have I got weakness? Has there been some sort of nerve involvement? So just have a close look at the two most commonly involved nerves, which is the axilla and the supscapula with that particular group. Um, and uh, the other thing that I do do is I really emphasize the inclusion of the kinetic chain early in rehab. Um, purely because we've got some evidence that it just has a preferential effect on local scapular recruitment and it just makes it easier for the patient when maybe they're a bit apprehensive or there are things that make them difficult for it to move. Um, in terms of patterning, um, I'm so sorry, I can't pronounce your name, it's amazing. 
Lilloshia. Sorry, I'm really sorry. I'm sure I pronounced that completely wrong. Um, any effective ideas on switching off scapular muscles in patterning? Um, so I have to say I'm probably a person who's been guilty of using the word muscle patterning and we used it really to try and validate a group of patients that had been written off as having voluntary instability. What we're finding now in our research is it relates very highly um, to um, pain beliefs and negative psychosocial factors. So we did some fMRI work, we looked at patients who failed um, instability had failed our rehabilitation in terms of um, general rehabilitation and all sorts of fancy things to try and get them better and when we actually did fMRI of their brains we found that all their movement processing was through the movement centers of their brain so it kind of brought us full circle so it's not a cop-out it's really important that the most important thing we need to do is actually address a patient's fear beliefs um, because if we don't do that with the best will in the world, there was some lovely work by Paul Hodges and Laura Mimosley many years ago that actually, I'm nearly getting there, sorry, that showed that many years ago that showed um, that people who had negative pain beliefs, even when their pain had gone away, completely continued to move with those compensatory strategies. So let me just see if I can get this to go down. Um, so yeah, I've had answered Adam's question. Sorry, guys, not very good at this. Um, there we go. Uh, uh, random question. Are there any studies looking at weight loss on scapular function? Overweight patients, pain and non-painful seem to have really poor scapula. Lee, that is a fantastic question. I have absolutely no idea. All I know is slim people who have uh, any sort of... Um, auxiliary surgery or any surgery where their arms on stretch are more likely to get a nerve injury um, but in terms of looking at weight loss and scapular function can't answer that one that's a brilliant one you've definitely stumped me there and I should be looking that up and seeing if I can find anything um, Bruno how hard do you find changing fear of movement in patients with a long history of pain do you have a secret trick my secret trick is to listen and understand the basis of those beliefs so I think you know we talk about symptom modification some people like it some people don't for me it's just a potential tool in challenging some of those pain beliefs it's very empowering to somebody to see that actually something that they've lived with for a long period of time we can suddenly change and if you ask what my typical response my typical approach to symptom modification is in my head I just think I'm going to unload I might give them some resistance to just change their movement strategy and I might incorporate the kinetic chain because I think we have some tentative evidence that it kind of makes life easier for the shoulder um, but again I'm basing that on my understanding of muscle function and what goes wrong in shoulder pain but also acknowledging um, that there's probably lots of different mechanisms and it could just be my reassurance it could be distraction but fundamentally I'm trying to unload as a basis for them building that patient back up again um, but so, but listening and understanding, so asking patients what they've been told about their shoulder pain, but then importantly asking them what that means to them, because actually a lot of the time, the things that are stopping people move without pain are purely because they've adopted these protective, um, strategies. So from my point of view, my tricks are those symptom modification, very, very simple, literally three or four things that seem to have good value in the clinic and if they're going to work great if they don't I'll probably have a good impression of that anyway from hearing the patient's story um, so invest in listening and understanding the individual and don't be afraid to challenge those beliefs remember if somebody comes with really high levels of pain and disability and they don't have a history of a pathology that's consistent with that so who comes with really horrible levels of pain? Um, somebody with horrible radiculopathy, somebody with a developing frozen shoulder, somebody with an acute calcific tendonitis or tendinopathy, um, and who else? Oh, and somebody maybe with a reactive tendinopathy. If they don't have a history consistent with those things, they've just got insidious onset pain and horrible levels of pain and very reluctant to move, you're going to invest in that story and understanding what's driving those fears. Now, I think there was one more question. Um, what do I think about the scapular dyskinesis test? I think for me, the only thing I really do in terms of the scapula is that scapular assistance test as part of my symptom modification. And as I say, I think it's a loading test. 
Um, when I was with Ben Kibler, they have their scapular retraction test where, again, they might do their cuff testing, but then do a scapular retraction and hold it in place and see if they're stronger. Again, I think we just have to be honest that we don't entirely understand what the mechanisms are. To me, if I unload somebody's shoulder, it makes it easier to move, then I'm just going to replicate that in my exercise prescription. But I think the other thing we mustn't underestimate is that if patients have an exercise that they perceive is meaningful to them based on something that changed their pain, then the adherence literature would suggest they're more likely to do it. So let's say I did a scapular assistance, it made their pain better, then I'm just going to replicate, as I said that before, whether it would be a band behind their back, leaning against the wall, something behind them, because then they know or they perceive they have an exercise that basically is based on their particular problem and they then feel more confident to move. And then we can use those same things into strategies to translate into their function. So what I would really say is that standing, and believe me, I've invested a lot of money in a lot of courses over the years, learning how to assess the minutiae of the scapula. So now to realise that it probably didn't have much basis is kind of slightly irksome, but actually quite empowering because it means we don't. But what is also massively important is we don't make our patients vigilant. Remember, I said from the outset, pe the, the guy that really got me wanting to talk about this and then Darren kind of suggested it as a subject was this guy was really vigilant about that scapular asymmetry. He was pretty mild and he had f no pain, full function and was back at the gym doing everything he wanted. But because the poor physio he met him the first time had really pointed this out and said it was stopping his muscles doing their job properly, that was a massive block to his belief of how well he'd done. So guess what? We did a lot of talking. So guys, I really hope that's been... Um, uh, da, 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 da. Oh, right, I'll do this last question from Daniel. So the question, in case you can't see it... Um, oh, goodness me. Uh, when Chris Littlewood and Philip Strife was on Adam's podcast, Philip talks about two retrospective studies on high-level athletes. And in those studies, they saw an association with injury or was it pain? So yeah, it was, so there is a mild increased association with a mild increased risk of developing interest in some studies, but it's not been borne out. So Klaas and Atal did a study, um, Anderson looked at it as well, and essentially there was one study that said, yes, scapular dyskinesis was predictive, but when they then looked at longer term follower for more athletes, they weren't able to bore out those, rele those results. And Chris Littlewood actually did a fantastic response to the Hickey article, actually breaking down the statistics and again showing there may be an increased association with a risk of developing shoulder pain. But I think we have to be careful saying it's causative. What I would say and what I find useful in the athletes I work with is change. So if it worsens, that to me is more predictive than it is a standalone measure. Um, sorry, I'm going to just see if I can... Yeah, absolutely, Adam. Huge confidence intervals. Completely agree. Um, scapular thoracic bursa. So this is the. I'm gonna leave this at this because my husband's cooking my tea, and I'm gonna be really unpopular if I don't stop soon. Um, do I believe in scapular thoracic bursa? They exist. We can see them on on um, in anatomical and cadaver studies. Um, does he remove them? So there was a there was a, a trend many years ago, a diagnosis uh, that they used to call snapping scapula, which they thought was due, due to these thickened bursa. And in fact, many, many years ago, they used to actually excise the superior medial border of the scapula. I'm delighted to say they don't do that anymore or very, very rarely, certainly not in the UK. Um, one of our surgeons used to do that. And I remember looking at him saying, but they've always had that bit of bone there. They've got no evidence that it's thickened. Why on earth are you going to take it away? Can we please try and do some physio and then see what happens? So we rehabbed them. None of them had surgery. So the bursa, are they relevant? I think we've had two patients in my entire shoulder career that have had injections into the subscapular bursa. Um, and I think it's fair to say it worked in one, it didn't in the other. And I'm not sure that it wasn't a placebo response. So it's not something I would spend a lot of time worrying about. Um, they're a very rare bunch. Len obviously sees a very uh, specific cohort and sees a lot of tertiary referral patients, as we do. Um, but I think it's something we went through a, fa a phase of doing, but we don't do any more. Uh, let me just check. I think I've answered everybody's questions. Thanks to Adam about, as I say, I would definitely recommend... Um, 
to sorry i just saw alec yes we've got loads scheduled we're going to be here every monday talking about subjects that you've asked me to talk about and some that i'd like to share with you anyway um adam made a very important point and i would really point you to that chris littlewood response to the hickey article about the predicted value of scapular dyskinesis because he did a lovely breakdown of all the statistics um the bottom line guys is don't spend loads and loads of time assessing the scapula Yes, no, it looks a bit wobbly as it's exciting as it can get. Symptom modification is more about changing pain than worrying about the scapula. Some patients will get a dramatic improvement in scapular positioning, but remember, a lot of them won't, and it doesn't matter because that doesn't correlate with whether they get better or not. Guys, thanks for joining. I hope I've shared loads of useful information with you. Um, as ever, we try and post some links afterwards, so I'll post links to some of those studies that I've mentioned so you can read them for yourself and make your own um, conclusions. Philip Strife's done some great work, as have some other authors looking at the relevance of this in our practice. So I'll certainly signpost those for some more reading. Um, so guys, as ever, I've gone over time, 35 minutes, all about scapular dyskinesis. But thanks so much for joining us. It was great to have some very big shoulder names there tonight um, and lots of my friends. So thanks so much for giving up your time and I'll see you again next Monday. Bye for now. <laughs>